Hi, everybody. Thanks for joining uh, us for this presentation. Thanks to Daniel for the introduction. Um, as he mentioned, the title of this presentation is A New Era for Multipoint Confocal Microscopy. So just give you a brief outline of what's to come. Um, we're going to, I'm going to give you a very, very brief confocal um, in, a, in a snapshot. I'm, going to, I'm really going to assume that most of you know what confocal imaging is, but just in case, I'll just do a couple of slides to uh, reiterate re, um, the point. Um, and then we'll move on to putting multi-point multi -point confocal imaging in context with point scanning confocal, which I suspect more of you know uh, than uh, about multipoint. We'll look at the strengths and weaknesses of both technologies and why there was a, there's room for improvement uh, in the confocal technology field. And then I will move on to these new advances in multipoint uh, obviously specifically in relation to a product that we are now um, selling uh, and look at the technology improvement uh, involved and the new, new horizons that that offers for confocal imaging. And hopefully you can bear with me for the preamble because we do need to put this in context, but you'll start, uh, by the end you'll start to see application plot shots such as this. This is a time lapse of 120 micron thick embryo fold folding. Um, so to be able to do this kind of sample, uh, thick sample imaging over time is actually a, a pretty remarkable achievement uh, for confocal in confocal terms. So very briefly, confocal imaging, what is it? So it's basically the, a, a means uh, by which we can obtain high contrast images if you compare it to a regular epifluorescent microscope. So basically light is focused through a pinhole to the sample. The sample is excited and then light that's emitted from the sample is a mixture of in focus, uh, that is information in the focal plane of the uh, objective and the sample, but also out of focus information. So this is light, that, that this is uh, parts of the sample that's, ex that's excited outside the focal plane. So all of the light from the admitted, emitted light comes through uh, the optic, the objective, back through to um, the detector, but before the detector is a second pinhole, and that second, that second pinhole basically uh, makes sure that only the in-focus light passes through it, and any out-of-focus light indicated by the red lines is blocked. Um, so basically you get light from planes other than the focal plane that are blocked uh, from being detected by your detector. This is a very simple um, schematic, and light paths are never that simple. Why do we want to use confocal imaging? Well, as you can see here on the left, a conventional epifluorescence image here of a, of a pollen grain, which is a fairly classic uh, sample to look at uh, to emphasize this point. The pollen grain here on the left, you can see, is very hazy. There is some detail you can see in there, but not very much. If we apply a, a confocal image plane, indicated, for example, here by the red um, space, the red, the red two red lines, we're capturing an image between those two red lines specifically, eliminating the outer focus information that, that actually exists for between the two blue lines. And this will give us a confocal image such as you see on the right. So now we see detail within that haze that, that was being masked in the epifluorescence image. And if we then sequentially image through the structure in the pollen grain in this case in 3D, so if we go through in a, in a series of Z sections down through the sample, we can create um, a 3D image and more typically here on the right, we'll be looking at structures, for example, within a cell in order to get a very good idea of their, of their um, 3D um, uh, distribution, for example, in the cell movement, etc. So this is why we want to capture 3D images typically. So now I'm going to jump pretty much straight to what we see in modern systems. So on the left-hand side here, you can see um, a laser scanning confocal microscope or a single point scanning microscope. Um, so here on the right hand side of this you can see the laser excitation source. As I mentioned it passes through a pinhole, is reflected from a mirror down to the sample and then the emitted light then passes back through the system through a second pinhole here at the top to um, a detector. And basically this captures an image effectively a point at a time. If you look at a multi-point scanner this is different um, in as much as we are still illuminating, uh, in this case, with a laser um, through pinholes. But you'll notice now that instead of a single pinhole, we have, a, in this case, a disk. It could, be, it could be any number of forms, but 
ordinarily it's a disk. We have a disk with multiple pinholes in, and this disk is rotating at, at high speed. So we're actually, instead of scanning your image a, p a single point at a time, we're constantly bathing the, light, the sample in multiple pinholes. Uh, this, again, passes through to a sample down below, comes back through um, pinholes, and then uh, is reflected to a detector, in this case a camera. I'll come uh, on later to the relevance of the differences in, de in detectors. So the most common method for confocal that people use is the laser scanning confocal microscope or the point scanner. As you can see here, it's illuminating uh, a point at a time. It's scanning across the sample, which typically you're rastering from X to Y, uh, across, across X, I should say, and down in Y. Uh, and this signal then is detected and created and rebuilt uh, via software on a PC, a pixel at a time. And this, as I said, is the most common method that people use. The key benefits of a laser scanning confocal microscope, which has made it as popular as, as it is, is that you get good spatial resolution and excellent confocality. It can be used across a broad range of magnifications. It's capable of simultaneous multi-wavelength capture. So traditionally, I guess, you can be looking up to four wavelengths uh, sequentially if your sample has that many probes in it, um, whereas traditionally a multi-point uh, system would be sequential. Uh, you're also able to do um, slightly unusual scans, for example, like an XZ and a YZ scan uh, so that you can do orthogonal sectioning. And also you have uh, additional zoom. So beyond the optics of the microscope itself, so for example the objective, uh, there is the ability to do some additional uh, optical zoom with the confocal scan head itself. However, like any technology, there are some weaknesses to it. The first one for many people, uh, depend well, for, for people depending on their application, would be that a single 512 by 512 pixel scan can typically take about one second. So this is good for fixed tissue and static samples, but tends to be poor for live cell imaging requiring reasonable temporal resolution. So you can speed up the system by, for example, doing bi-directional scanning. So instead of scanning X uh, across X and then back to the beginning and across X again, you can, you can go from left to right to left to right to left. Uh, so this will speed up, uh, this will double your scan speed. But there are then become some synchronization issues when you start to do this. Uh, and to get, that, to get the Im image well aligned um, when you're doing bi bi-directional scanning, uh, it's still not that reliable and you can end up with sort of interlaced images so it can be used but it's not necessarily the cleanest of methods and also for reasons we'll come on to you require a relatively high laser power for a good signal this results in photo bleaching uh, so you lose signal in your, in your image the more you uh, image the same sample or the same area and also results potentially in phototoxicity uh, so this is particularly bad for uh, live cell imaging And these days, most people are doing multidimensional imaging, so it's not simply a single color uh, in Z, um, and maybe not even necessarily fixed, I'd say often live. So when you're doing 2D imaging, I guess a, a point scanner is, is certainly fantastic for, for that kind of imaging. Um, when you start to get to 2D over time, particularly in this case for vesicle, uh, looking at vesicle movement, where you want to have very rapid uh, frame rates and follow uh, movement of elements in a cell, then uh, the speed of, a, of an, a laser scanning confocal can become an issue. Um, even if you've got something that's uh, a static, like a pollen grain, um, they're very deep um, structures to, to image, so it can take quite a while to do a complete Z section, a complete Z scan to a sample such as this. Uh, if you're looking at something like um, 4D imaging, so there would be some uh, Z as well as XY over time, uh, for example, a cell dividing, then this is very sensitive to overexposure of light. You can literally stop cells from dividing by overexposing them to light. So this is another challenge for laser scanning confocal microscopes. Um, and then I guess what you might call the fifth dimensional imaging by using multiple wavelengths. Um, this is something that, as I said, laser scanning confocal microscopes can do simultaneously. That's not so much of the issue, but it's again the speed that you can image at uh, whilst um, looking at live samples. And then there's obviously six dimensional imaging. So if you're going to be doing multiple fields, I guess obviously you want to get through those fields as quickly as possible for the 
higher speeds you can image at, the better. So, the multi-point confocal uh, microscopy. What is it in relation to laser scanning? The very first uh, versions of a multi-point system, as I uh, said or um, hinted to earlier, was based on a disk uh, full of pinholes, uh, and this disk spins at a high speed. So you're constantly bathing the, sa the sample, scanning the sample with thousands of pinholes. Um, I'd say the original design was a single disk with lots of pinholes. One of the issues with it, though, and actually this design is still used in, in some spinning disk systems, but one of the main challenges with this system is the fact that for all the light that you put into the system from a, a light source such as a laser, you only get 1% to 2% of that light through to the sample. Now, these days, with lasers um, being quite powerful, uh, this can be overcome to some extent, but um, still, there's, there's a, there's a, there is a quite a decrease in efficiency here that still needs to be overcome, even though you have uh, quite powerful lasers. So, uh, a company called Yokogawa, uh, a fair number of years ago now, developed what they call uh, a dual NIPCO disk. So, NIPCO was the, was the um, uh, guy who uh, originally came up with the, the first disk design of multiple uh, pinholes in a, in a disk. And then Yokogawa took this uh, principle and added a second disc. And the second disc basically has a series of micro lenses that match the uh, pinholes of the imaging disc. And these micro lenses basically collect light from the laser and focus them per pinhole in, in the actual imaging disc itself. So this means that we go from a 1% to 2% transmission to a 70% efficiency in uh, passing light through the disc. So this basically turned what was still what was a relatively slow um, imaging uh, multipoint solution to uh, a much faster one. Uh, there are also some other, some other elements that actually make it even, even more powerful as far as speed is concerned, which we will come to. <coughs> Sorry, excuse me. Um, so this is now what um, a, a modern, uh, this is the, the dual disk in a, in a more schematic um, fashion. So as, as you can see, we have the first disc, which is the collector disc. This has the micro lenses in, and then the lower disc is the pinhole disc, or the imaging disc, uh, which is really doing all of the, the work as far as uh, creating a high contrast confocal image. And the unit that, uh, the most popular unit by far for this over the years, it, it's gone through various re um, revisions, but would be, people would know it as the CSU-10 or CSU-22 or X1 as the unit uh, that's there. We combine that with a whole a series of, of hardware components such as laser and cameras um, um, and other elements and synchronize this all together with software to give you the, um, the full imaging package. And that we call the Revolution XD. So in subsequent slides, you'll hear this called the, the Revolution XD. So there's a word of caution here, as I've alluded to. Not all multipoints are the same. So there are still some systems, for example, using uh, a single disk, uh, and therefore they still have some of the limitations on the transmission, for example, uh, that the uh, original design had. There are other multi-point systems out there too, which I'm not going to cover in detail here. Um, but if it is a single NIP code disk that's being used, then there are ways uh, to increase the light throughput uh, through those systems. One is to increase the size of the pinholes. Uh, this is good, but reduces the confocality, which gives you a less sharp, you know, lower contrast image. Uh, and the other way is to increase the number of pinholes, which obviously gives you more light to your sample. But then the consequence of this will be higher background, even on thin samples, and you will understand why that is uh, later in the presentation. So with confocal imaging, like, I get, well, like any imaging really, it's all about the photons. So it's, it's critical that you get maximum amount of light both into the system uh, and out of the system um, for, for maximum efficiency. Uh, this way you can uh, be, as I guess, try and use as gentle a light source as possible uh, if it's efficient on the way to the sample. Uh, this means you can reduce photo bleaching and phototoxicity. Uh, and then you really want a, a, a high degree of sensitivity on the, on the uh, emission side, on the detection, uh, again, for reasons of sensitivity, photo bleaching, and toxicity, but also uh, you want a system that's going to give you a really good signal-to-noise ratio. So that's uh, signal from your sample compared with uh, noise that might be within the, the optical uh, elements of, of the system you're working with. 
Um, so really you want to be looking at minimizing things like the complexity of the light path, uh, having a particularly good detector uh, for that good signal to noise and sensitivity. Um, I'll say maximize the number of photons that you get out of your system. Uh, and you can see here, for example, uh, this is a, uh, a confocal light path, which as you can see is, is basically reflecting off many, many surfaces. So each time it's, it's either going through a, a lens or, a, or bouncing off a mirror, you'll be losing a certain amount of light. So the aim is always to try and keep that to a minimum. <coughs> but um, as I said, singly the most important factor uh, is in photon collection probably. In these days with lasers being quite powerful, getting light to the sample is not that difficult. Um, but, but you do need to balance that off by having a particularly sensitive detector. If you don't have a sensitive detector, then you have to put in a higher amount of excitation light, which will uh, bleach or give you uh, phototoxicity problems. <coughs> so you are looking in your detector for the highest sensitivity possible, and also to give you a good signal to noise um, uh, ratio. So just to explain the differences in detection between uh, a point scanner and a, um, a multi-point scanner, here on the left is a point scanner. So the detector that's used here is a photomultiplier tube or PMT. Uh, but in the case of a multi-point system, then we are using a, a more conventional, if you like, camera. The camera itself isn't conventional at all. Um, it, it's a, it is a CCD, but these are scientific uh, sensors. So for example, um, what really brought multipoint uh, confocal units to life was the, um, the um, um, development of the EM CCD, an electron multiplying uh, CCD uh, card charge couple device. So here on the left, for example, is our, is our version of this, the Ixon Ultra. This is where we really uh, came into the market. Well, this, is, this, is, this is our um, uh, leading technology here at Andor. And, and it's, it's the sensitivity of an EM CCD, the ability to amplify signal over background noise that really brings multipoint uh, systems to life. Because multipoint systems are traditionally uh, photon, uh, they're low with respect to, to transmission because of the pinholes. So you do need a sensitive detector in order to maximize the light. And that's also true for a point scanner. The pinholes basically uh, reduce the amount of light you get out of the system. So it's, it's about getting as much sensitivity as possible on your detector. So if we look at these two different detectors, so we're looking at PMTs here in the first place. Traditional PMTs have a quantum efficiency, so this is the, this is the um, ability, if you like, of the detector to capture photons. Um, then if you look at the quantum efficiency of uh, a PMT, traditional PMTs at best are around about 25% QE, quantum efficiency. There are now some newer uh, PMTs that are reaching uh, quantum efficiencies of about 50, 48, 50 percent uh, in the in the in the blue blue to green range. Um, but uh, what you sometimes find is you have to choose a PMT that's relevant to the wavelength that you're imaging at. Now, if you compare the quantum efficiencies here, so if you remember 25 to 50 percent tops, and you compare it to um, a CCD such as the uh, EM CCD here. Uh, that we have on, on the right, the, the ultra, then you can see that we get quantum efficiencies in this case of, uh, depending on, um, on, the, on the type of sensor, anything from 90% uh, or above in pretty much across a much, much more broader um, range of the spectrum. So it's, it's a single detector uh, and it's more versatile as far as uh, detecting the, the, the full spectrum. Uh, that, that you would typically use for a lot of these popular dyes that you can see listed here. So that means that with that sensitivity, we can run at, at, at high speed. So we get sharp images and we can do high speed imaging at, at sort of sample at a 512 by 512. So if you remember on a, on a point scanner, a typical point scanner setup, you'd be looking at about one second for 512 by 512. Um, uh, imaging, pixel uh, uh, dimension imaging, um, and you can see here that a second wouldn't really be long enough. We are looking here at uh, vesicles. If you look in the middle here, you can see two vesicles fusing, a smaller one that's sort of a little bit behind the larger one, and these vesicles are anything from three microns in diameter for the large to one micron diameter for the small. 
Um, we need to do a 3D volume because they're not all in the same um, plane. They're not all in the same actual plane. So we're, in this instance, we're doing 8Z sections um, with 0.8 micron Z spacing, and we're capturing that small stack every 700 milliseconds. So if you've got the system scanning at one second, you will have missed uh, a lot of that detail. Uh, and you, would be, you, you really wouldn't see this level of detail of how these two vesicles, for example, endosomes are, are fusing. So this is where multi-point scanner in combination with a, a, a sensitive detector really comes into its own. So I guess just a few just a few points here, just a little table to summarize the differences between uh, the multi-point dual spinning disk versus a point scanner is that, as I mentioned, the point scanner is only imaging one point at a time, whereas the, 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 the confocal spinning disk unit here, the CSU, is doing a thousand points uh, per scan, if you like, uh, of, of the sample. Um, consequently, we're capturing all of those in parallel at the same time across the full um, field of view of the, of the sensor, uh, whereas it builds build up a pixel at a time uh, in the point scanner. Um, the key difference here, though, as far as sensitivity and being able to run at any speed is concerned, is the detector quantum efficiency. So I've actually I've been a little bit mean here and put 30%. As we've seen, it could be up to 50% now, um, but still significantly less than an EMCCD. This means that uh, we can run, certainly at least with the, the Ixon uh, Ultra EMCCD there, full frame 512 or 512, we can run at 56 frames per second. It is possible to run at 40 frames uh, per second at 512 by 512 on a point scanner, but there is some sacrifice there, which we'll come to very, very shortly. Um, and then the other things we need to be careful of are things like the bleach rate. Obviously, if you've got something that's happening uh, quickly in your sample, um, if, you're, if you're using a point scanner and it's taking time to scan your sample, then there will be a skew in time from where you start at the top left-hand side of your sample or scan to the bottom right-hand side. So uh, there'll be some uh, time skew there, potentially, depending on how fast you're your um, physiology is in your cell. Um, but there are things, for example, that a point scanner can do. We have, you can have these programmable, program, sorry, programmable scan patterns to do the, uh, and also do these X, Z, Y, Z scans. Uh, and the other uh, key advantage at this point uh, of the presentation uh, between uh, a typical traditional uh, spinning disk system, a multi-point scanner and a point scanner is that you have a variable pinhole um, for a point scanner, which means that you can adjust your pinhole, which you need to do, and I haven't explained uh, just for purposes of time, but if you have different objectives on your, on your microscope from high mag to low mag, each of those have different numerical apertures. Um, in an ideal world, you should be varying your pinhole. You, you, it'll, you'll be doing it on many of your systems without you even knowing it. Uh, the pinhole will be changing in size. Um, to account for the difference in numerical aperture. So that's adjustable uh, on a point scanner. It's not traditionally, traditionally uh, not um, an option uh, on a, on a, a multi-point system. Uh, so as I said, I've been talking about traditional systems up, till, up until now on both the point scanner and the multi-point scanner, but actually there have been, there are more recent laser scanning confocal improvements, which some of you may already be benefiting from out there. So there, there are the new uh, gallium arsenide phosphate PMTs, which I mentioned give you a, an increased or improved QE up to sort of 40 to 50 percent, um, but this still isn't as high, obviously, as the, as the CCD that we would use on a multi-point scanner. Uh, and then the other um, significant uh, improvement in recent times, as far as speed certainly is concerned on a point, point scanner, is the resonance scanner technology. So with resonance scanning technology, we can, you can reach up to 40 frames per second at a 512 by 512 pixel scan. However, in order to reach these speeds, you have to sacrifice the field of view. So you trade basically for a smaller scan range in order to achieve your speed. So uh, whereas the multipoint, you don't have to, you don't sacrifice uh, your field of view in order to get a, a, a 56 frame per second scan rate, for example. Uh, and the other thing you uh, potentially do with the resonance scanner is you are, to some extent, um, sacrificing um, 
sensitivity. Actually, that would probably be not quite right. You're, you're basically, you, you will struggle for, uh, you'll reduce your signal to noise ratio, um, so you will lose a bit of sensitivity. You lose sensitivity because you're basically scanning faster, so you don't have the same, you don't dwell on the same place as long in your sample, so it's like sort of having a shorter exposure, if you like, uh, on, a, on a conventional camera-based system. So that means you either need to compensate with higher laser power, which as we know will give you bleaching or phototoxicity, or you have to live with a lower signal-to-noise ratio. But multi-point confocals are by no means perfect traditionally. So the uh, challenges with a multi-point system is that Multipoints were originally designed based on the CCD, the, the, the detector of the time, which was a Sony ICX, which had a, a chip size of 10 by 8 millimeters, which means that the field of view that was designed in the, in the early models was also 10 by 8 uh, millimeters. Now we have much bigger sensors, and so uh, you couldn't maximize the benefit of the bigger sensors on, the, on this older technology. Um, so it was a fraction of the full field of view that people are now becoming accustomed to with the new SCMOS uh, detectors. It also meant that it was limited for people wanting to work with large samples, uh, and also it had a lim li limited sampling area, so uh, more difficult if you were wanting to get through, uh, you know, have a higher throughput, put more samples, if you like, through your system. And the other, one of the other key disadvantages uh, was the fact that it has a, the multipoint has a fixed pinhole. As you see, it's, it's a, the, the multipoint system is based on a disk that has pinholes uh, put into it, um, and those pinholes are, are fixed. There's no way of, of, ma of changing their diameter. As I mentioned on a point scanner, the point scanner is a single pinhole, so that pinhole is easily uh, drivable. Uh, you can drive it, sort of, you know, make it more open or close it according to the uh, numerical aperture of the objective. Um, so um, because it was fixed, the original design was really aimed at, at high magnification work, so um, objectives like 60x, 63x, uh, or higher 100, 100x uh, that have high NA, so NAs of 1.4 objectives. So it was really designed for, for high, high mag objectives. Um, so and it was designed to maximize sensitivity but with sort of moderate, moderately thick samples, um, so sort of things like sort of single cells to, to, um, to maybe a, a few, multi, few cells in, in thickness. Um, and so it did have a limited success for people who wanted to use, for example, lower mag objectives. Um, they had th th there was limited success here to work with l large samples because lower mag objectives require um, a um, a bigger pinhole, a wider pinhole, which we're not able to uh, offer uh, on, a, on a spinning disk system uh, such as this. So it meant that your confocality as a consequence uh, started to go. So as you went down in magnification and lower in NA, you would start to lose confocality. Uh, so that then gives you a high background with thick samples. So to summarize, traditionally the multipoint scanners have been excellent for 60x to 100x. Uh, but for anything below that, it's not optimized, uh, and you can get background problems. And those background problems are basically uh, down to uh, what we would call pinhole crosstalk. So if you look on the left here, we have a, a, a thin sample, so let's say a single cell. So you can see that the light coming back from the, from the thin sample, the outer focus light is being blocked by the solid disk either side of the pinhole with the uh, in-focus image passing through, giving us our confocal image. However, if you use the same disk uh, with the same size pinhole, but use it on a thicker sample, on a thicker sample you have more out of focus information coming from it. The result is that, that more the, 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 the increased out of focus um, uh, information or, or signal uh, is basically spread across a wider seg sector of the disk, and consequently it spills over into neighboring pinholes, and this then gives you higher background. So a classic example I is here. So, I mean, this, this data set looks, looks pretty reasonable uh, when you look at it. I always think it's pretty impressive to watch. So this is looking at, at two colors um, uh, in dividing cells. Obviously, you can see here the um, chromosomes uh, and the spindles labeled up here. So you can see the, uh, you can see the cell division uh, going through. Um, so the, the multipoint scanner is used here because of its low phototoxicity, 
Um, as I said earlier, cell division is really sensitive to uh, too much light, so point scanners typically struggle uh, to, to do this kind of imaging at any high, you know, at any significant rate. Um, so we can get some high 3D sampling here, looking at cells dividing. However, you can see that there is a lot of background uh, information here, and that's because this is a thick sample. Um, we're getting crosstalk between the pinholes. So really, you know, ideally, we want to have higher contrast here so that we're able to distinguish detail, the detail that we're really interested in against the background. So we know that multipoint units excel in speed and in sensitivity and give us a good signal to noise ratio. Um, but we have just seen that they fall short as far as uh, removing the haze. If you've got a thick sample, they're really optimized for thin optical sectioning. Um, and all single photon systems, whether that's laser scanning or, uh, or um, multi-point, all single photon systems uh, traditionally struggle uh, with samples thicker than 50 microns. And so we're really looking for a solution still to work with thick samples whilst maintaining speed uh, and sensitivity. And this is where now I'm finally getting to the point uh, where we have uh, the solution to that. And it really is a, a breakthrough in um, working with a, a broad range of samples, not just single cell, but right through to, to thick samples and large samples. So we're really removing the limitations that were there both for multipoint, but that also were some of the limitations for the, multi, uh, for the single point as well. And this, in our case, is in the form of the Revolution WD. So the Revolution WD um, is, a brand, is, is, a, is a brand new multipoint scanner. It's improving the technology that was already uh, very popular. Um, it does this by increasing the pinhole spacing so that we remove more of that out-of-focus information that you saw uh, on the previous slide. This increases the signal to noise ratio, um, so it gives us much cleaner images. Um, we've also, uh, there's also um, a second pinhole, there's, so there's now instead of a single, um, a single dual disk being uh, present, there's now two dual disks that you can potentially have in your system. Uh, so there's one with a, a small pinhole and one with a large pinhole uh, to um, give you um, uh, more choice across your objective range. So we're no longer limited to high mag, high NA objectives. Uh, at the same time, the, uh, the redesign has taken into account the fact that we're now using here, these, these cameras here that you can see in the bottom right-hand corner. So these are SCMOS cameras. Uh, th this, these, again, are something that uh, uh, Andor have, have led uh, into the market with. And so it was recognized that these were going to be the CCDs, the sensors of the future. And so they've taken away the limitation. If, if you remember right, if you remember me saying earlier, the original design was based around a smaller Sony ICX chip. We've now rem they've now removed that XY um, dimension limitation and opened it up so that you now maximize the field of view of a uh, SCMOS. And then you still have all the benefits of a multipoint scanner, which is speed, sensitivity, signal to noise ratio, low photo bleaching, and low photo toxicity. This is a brief comparison of the XD, which is the original technology, um, versus the WD, which is the new. So here, as I mentioned, you can see the difference in the field of view going from seven by oh, sorry, going from seven uh, by ten millimeters up to sixteen, uh, nearly seventeen by fourteen millimeters. The other key thing here, as I said, is that you've got a choice of two pinhole sizes, the 25 and 50 micron, compared with the traditional 50 micron of um, the point scanner, of, of the, um, uh, the original uh, multi-point single disk system. Uh, and you can see now, I mentioned the fact that uh, the pinhole spacing has been increased. So in the, in the original design, there was a 250 micron uh, space between, uh, linear space between the pinholes. This has now been increased to 500 micron uh, spacing. So the, the result of this is that whereas before we were limited to good contrast imaging up to about 50 microns in thickness of the sample, you'll see later that this, as far as I can tell at this moment in time, is really more, down, it's more limited by your sample than it is uh, by the optics of the system itself. Um, 
There are some differences, though, uh, in speed here between the two systems. There's a bigger disk required, which means that we, c that the, the, the we can't have a disk that rotates at such a high speed. So the original design uh, could give you a frame rate, not that anybody ever really runs it that high, but will give you a technical frame rate of 2,000 uh, frames per second, whereas on the WD, uh, because we have to reduce the, the spin speed of the disk, uh, then that gives you potentially a maximum frame rate of uh, 200 frames per second. But actually we find in reality, particularly with thick samples, we need to do, um, I haven't explained the, the finer detail here, but um, 200, uh, in so that the pinholes of a, of a disk, uh, that, that pattern of multiple pinholes in a disk, you don't necessarily need a full revolution of the disk for a single scan. Um, so it, it's basically a, a segment, a sector of a disk. Uh, you only need part of a rotation to get a full confocal scan of your sample. Um, so on, on that principle, um, you can, I say, do up to 2,000 frames per second on the, on the XD. On the WD, that slows down to 200 frames per second. But what you can find is on thicker samples, um, if you want to avoid a certain amount of, you, you can get some optical artifact, then if you do a full rotation of the disk, then you can get a, a, um, a the perfect image, if you like, um, as far as um, any kind of um, noise is concerned in the system. So then that means that you get a, a if you do a full scan, a full rotation of on the WD, then that gives you a, a frame a, a frame rate of 67 frames per second. But that's still probably for 90 percent, 80 to 90 percent of people's applications, that's more than fast enough, and it's faster than the full frame rate of the um, EMCCD, for example, that we that we put on the system. Um, other elements now is is that we have a, a bright field bypass as standard. If, if some of you have used the um, the uh, original uh, XD system or the, the original Yokogawa system, you'll know that the bright field bypass was was an option. It's now standard uh, on the WD and, and a much simpler light path as well in order to do that. Um, and then you have other things like uh, there's there's dual camera versions that are, that are as options. Uh, that in the case of the WD, there is a, a specific model that gives you a split view, that which means you can have a single camera solution, uh, but, but run two uh, wavelengths simultaneously, uh, one wavelength on half of your CCD and, and the second wavelength, wavelength on the other. So this gives you at least two channels simultaneous uh, high-speed imaging. That, that would have been an option on the original model with an additional device. Uh, and then with the new WD uh, not quite yet available, there will be some near-infrared capability, which, uh, which I'll, I'll touch on again sh uh, shortly. Uh, and there are also built-in um, emission filter wheels in the new system as well. So what does the increased pin pinhole spacing do for us? Well, I mentioned earlier that you know, if you have a thin sample uh, with the um, 250 micron spacing between the pinholes, then it's fine with a thin sample, but when you move to a thick sample, as you, if you'll remember, you get this cross torque as the outer focus light uh, spills over into neighboring pinholes. So by increasing from 250 to 50 microns, you can see here on the right hand uh, most image here that um, even with thick samples, you're now blocking, you're still blocking the outer focus information, so you're reducing the, the chance, the likelihood of spillover into neighboring pinholes. So this gives you a higher contrast. Uh, more confocal image. Um, and this is basically what the, what the difference is uh, as far as the two systems are concerned. So on the left is the XD. So you can see if you compare the two that the disk size has increased uh, because we have uh, bigger, sp more spacing between the pinholes. It's also bigger because we have, we now have to actually illuminate a larger field of view because of the SCMOS. So we have to spread, we have to basically illuminate over a larger area. So, um, so consequently, the disk the, the disk size increases, which, as I said, is why we have to uh, therefore reduce the, the spin speed uh, for stability reasons. Um, but you can see that the benefit is that you get a larger field of view, and as I mentioned, uh, uh, better contrast on thick samples. Um, and so, as I said, the system you can have up to two disks. So, in this uh, schematic here, um, you can see that there on the left here, you can see that you you can have the the two disks in here. You can have a single disk unit if you like, um, but you can have the two disks and basically according to whether you're using a high NA uh, uh, objective or a low NA objective, you can then select your pinhole size accordingly. Um, and 
that these just simply move across the light path and there's a middle position here if you look on the right hand side there's a middle position whereby you can have a bright field bypass uh, and so if you're wanting to do high quality DIC imaging for example in amongst your fluorescence imaging then uh, that's when you would use the bright field bypass so uh, this gives you an idea of um, the, the, the difference in performance so in the top image here on the right hand side this is an XZ scan so th this is looking we've done XYs we've done a Z section I should say a Z series through a sample and now we're looking at the orthogonal view so we're looking uh, at the Z uh, aspect here of the sample so the top image uh, is using the uh, original uh, technology the, the X um, D uh, and the lower image is now using the WD as captures it's the same sample uh, but the top is the is the original technology the XD revolution XD and below is the revolution WD and you can see between these two images that there is a, a definite elimination of haze uh, if you compare those two images so there's an improvement uh, significant improvement in the image quality there <coughs> and if we if we also look because a lot of people when they're looking at, at confocals they're really interested uh, to well they like to be reassured let's say that the that the actual resolution so the resolution in Z the performance is, is, is good and is giving them good resolution so uh, in order to do this you would look at the point spread function so you would have a a bead, a fluorescent bead, which is a, a, a round, a small uh, point of light, uh, and you would then do a, a, Z, a Z series through that uh, bead, and then look at it, uh, look look to see how um, how tight it is through Z, basically how how discreet, if you like, uh, it is through Z. Um, so on uh, in, uh, on this slide here, um, the image is on the left, the top left image is the um, is the image captured through uh, a Z series of a bead on the Andor uh, Revolution WD? So this is a YZ um, view, uh, and on the lower uh, left image is the same uh, bead, but um, well, it's not the same bead, but it's, it's looking at the same size bead, uh, but using a, um, a, a point scanner, a laser scanning confocal microscope. Uh, we've used as close an objective magnification as possible. They both have the same um, NA. Uh, we've used one area unit. Uh, one area unit is, is, is the, uh, if you like, the matched confocal, uh, sorry, pinhole ap aperture to this particular objective. And we obviously have the 50 micron pinhole that we would use at this magnification for the WD. So here you can see a through series of the bead. And then the d on the right hand side are the graphs um, for the intensity, normalized intensity measurements through that Z series for both. Uh, of these systems so as I said the top is the revolution WD and the bottom is the point scanner and you can see that the point the point spread function here uh, on the WD is between six to seven hundred nanometers um, so that's the, the full width half max uh, of this uh, of this graph uh, and if you look at the point spread function of the point scanner um, then it's uh, circa 800 nanometers um, when we tried to do this if I'm honest we struggled because um, the the signal to noise ratio on the point scanner there, there were long um, exposures required here so it, it was actually a reasonably noisy image so um, our data isn't quite so tight here so but you can see anyway that six to seven hundred na nanometers compared to eight hundred nanometers is very favorable uh, in fact if not a little bit better um, so the performance actual performance which is what confocal microscopy for most people is about is is very very good so as I mentioned, the first thing is that we have a difference in the field of view. Uh, one of the key things here is, is the improvement in the field of view. So this is what an XD used to see, and this is what a WD now sees. So if you have large samples or you simply want to be able to image more cells at a time because you need to have high, high end numbers for measurements and statistical analysis, then clearly you're going to get a much better throughput, uh, a much higher sampling rate with the Revolution WD. Um, so in combination with the fact you have a large field of view for large samples, the added benefit here is that we can really do truly deep imaging. Uh, so here's that, uh, this is the embryo that I showed you earlier. So this is a 120 micron thick, thick embryo, 3D over time. Uh, so this is you know, pretty deep for, for any level of imaging. And here on the right hand side, we've got a 250 micron thick uh, mouse ovary, um, which uh, we are imaging uh, live, uh, though this isn't a live movie I'm showing you, but we have imaged it live and at high speed 
uh, with the WD. So just to give you a, a sense of the quality that you can get here, because if you're particularly if you're um, familiar with point scanners, you'll obviously be, as I said, you'll be used to have seeing good resolution uh, and good confocality. So here uh, in this uh, slide, we've got um, a sample that's about 150 microns thick, uh, and we've, they're WASP embryos. Uh, we've gone through a 3D volume of these, so 106 Z planes, so that's um, an image every, every micron. Uh, we're using, which I'll come to actually uh, in a bit, we're using a specifically here a 30 times a silicon oil objective, and we're using the full field of view of the SB MOS. So you can see, if I run this movie, it's slightly compressed uh, for the purposes of this presentation, but you can see here that we've got am you know, amazing clarity, contrast, and detail here uh, in this data set, uh, and have imaged you know, very, very deep and right through to the other side, so we're not, we're not losing any uh, signal or detail. And if you compare, we, we, li we did image this both on a point scanner as well as uh, on our multi-point scanner. And a point scanner to collect this data set with a, uh, would take about 15 minutes. Uh, but in the case of the multi-point scanner, the Revolution WD, this takes 20 seconds. So you can see a significant uh, improvement in time. So if, if, for example, you're doing live cell imaging, this will just give you temporal resolution way beyond uh, what you would achieve with a, with a point scanner. But even if you're doing fixed sample, uh, fixed, you know, if you're imaging fixed samples, let's say you're looking at zebrafish and you've got your zebrafish uh, uh, all, all in rows or columns under your cover slip and you just simply want to get through as many samples as possible, then you're going to get a significant time saving here by using uh, a multi-point scanner. Um, here we have, which uh, kind of uh, amazed me somewhat, but here we have a 530 micron uh, deep heart sample that we've, uh, that we've looked at. Um, this is using the 50 micron pinhole again. In this, is, in this case, we're using a 40 times water immersion objective, uh, and we've got SB MOS, but for purposes of, um, well, probably in this case, more data handling, uh, we've binned the, um, the, the camera uh, just, just to make the, the the image a little bit um, smaller for running movies, etc. So um, if I if I show you this, um, so this is this is the, the heart sample. So this is running through 530 microns. You can see uh, that that as you look towards the back of the sample, we are getting some um, I guess loss of detail and, and, and intensity. Um, I say here, I think the limitations uh, probably are as much about um, the sample itself, so how dense the sample is. Obviously, if you've got a dense sample, then light won't travel as efficiently through it. So you, you'll get a, you will get probably uh, a certain amount of, um, you'll get some certain challenge with just how much light you can get back out of the sample. But also the objective, how well the objective is performing uh, that deep uh, into a, a sample as well. So um, it, it is, that is kind of unusually thick, but it does give you hopefully a very good idea of what uh, can be achieved. Um, but it's not really just necessarily about, about thick samples. So this here is a, is a 45 micron thick Drosophila embryo. Um, we know that, uh, though I can't show you the data, but we, we took this to, um, uh, to somebody, to show somebody, uh, the Revolution WD took it to, some, to show somebody who was typically really finding it difficult to find any uh, imaging system, uh, point scanner or otherwise, to image his sample. He's, his staining is, is quite, um, uh, is, is, is sort of specific, but, but it's also quite sort of spread throughout his sample, which you can see here. So it looks like there's quite a lot of background, but that, that is genuine staining in his sample. So he's, he's trying to sort of distinguish signal from, from um, some inherent, if you like, uh, staining uh, noise from, from the staining in the sample itself. Um, and, and basically he, he's struggling to, to see what he's interested in against some of the background staining in his sample. And as I said, point scanners uh, weren't even, uh, were even a challenge for him. So we looked at the sample, 50 micron pinhole again. Uh, we're using a 30x silicon oil objective here. Um, in this instance, um, sensitivity uh, is uh, an element here. So we've, instead of it being uh, an, EM, uh, an SC MOS, which I'll explain the differences in sensitivity shortly, we've, used, uh, we've gone back to an EMCCD here. So it's a 512 by 512 uh, data set. Um, and it's taken basically two minutes to collect. Um, well, actually, I'll, I'll come to that point in a minute. So if I, if I show you this data set, 
So now, so this I say it's only 45 microns thick, but he is, he is now imaging here at, at Nyquist. So uh, actually, I, I don't have here how many Z sections this is, and I can't remember. I'm uh, embarrassed to say off the top of my head. But it, it, this has got high Z sampling in it, so it, it's, it's a significantly um, large data set as far as uh, Z sampling is concerned. And you can see, as we play through the movie, that, th that you can see the, the staining on both the top and the lower surfaces of the sample. And he'd never been able to achieve that. He, he'd been able to see the top, but by the time he got to the bottom on a, on a, with the laser scanning, basically the, the signal was just disappearing. And, and the, 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 the idea might be that it's disappearing because uh, due to photo bleaching uh, as much as anything else. Um, but also, if you look at the time it takes to collect this data, that's a two-minute uh, collection. Uh, so with a, with, our, with a multipoint, the Revolution WD, we're looking at two minutes to collect that red fluorescent protein Psi 5 data, whereas he, uh, the equivalent uh, 512 by 512 on the laser scanning was taking this particular uh, individual researcher 40 minutes for the same, for the same scan. Uh, and I say we, we believe that it's the bottom, bottom line is that it was bleaching before it reached the end of the series. Um, but looking at something a little bit more live, uh, because most of those have been uh, static, um, here we've got uh, some, an example of, some of calcium imaging uh, here in a, in a zebrafish brain. So we're imaging here, this is only a single plane, where, where there's no Z series here, this is just a single plane, approximately 100 microns into a zebrafish brain. We're using the 50 micron pinhole again because we have a 63x, uh, in this case, water immersion objective. And here, because it's calcium, we, we want high speed. We also want sensitivity here as well. Then we're using the, uh, the EMCCD in this is the Exxon Ultra. So if I play this movie, oh, what's happened there? I do apologize. Um, so if I play this movie, then uh, you can see uh, here, this, this, uh, this happened to be only running at about 10 frames per second, uh, but it's still fast. Uh, compared for 512 by 512 um, uh, here, and so if you look, you can uh, you can see actually there's not much calcium signal. Uh, there's not much calcium response going in this sample. The movement you can see is actually uh, vessels, uh, blood vessels, I guess uh, cells moving through uh, vessels in the background. Um, but the fact that the point here is that we're imaging 100 microns into the brain. Uh, when we tried this, uh, we had tried this on the uh, XD system. We simply just cannot get the contrast in the image this deep into the brain to get any meaningful information out of it. And from the point of view of a point scanner, you would um, struggle to run at those speeds uh, that deep uh, into the sample, maintaining that level, that size of uh, field of view. Uh, and then this is this is. This is the zebrafish again, but this is just a 3D. This was a Z stack and then a 3D reconstruction. So this was imaged but between 80 microns and 120 microns, uh, sorry, from 80 microns into the brain to 120 uh, in the zebrafish brain that we just saw the calcium data to. Um, other applications, for example, would be uh, embryology. So you know, when you're looking at embryology, you're looking at multicellular, so things like cell colony, uh, colonies and multicellular um, uh, cell um, colonies, so so you're looking certainly in, in depth beyond a single cell in thickness, uh, and you might be wanting, for example, in this instance, a follow cell division. So um, so here uh, you can see we're capturing high contrast uh, images for cell for following cell division. Phototoxicity is still not an issue uh, because if if we've got low phototoxicity because the cells are dividing, uh, as I said, you know if uh, if there's too much light in the system because you won't get the cells dividing. Uh, and in this instance, the researcher uh, reported that there was actually less bleaching uh, here uh, in, this, in this particular sample um, compared with the, the, the CSUX or, or the XD system. Uh, in this instance, we're using a 1K by 1K, um, 1,000 pixel by 1,000 pixel EMCCD uh, for that data set. Um, but it's not the revolution. Uh, this has all really been so far about large and deep, but, but it isn't all about large samples. The WD is still a perfectly valid and actually very, a, a very, very good system for doing the single cell work that, that, this, that the uh, technology was, was you know, traditionally designed for. Um, so here we have a, an example where um, yeast have been, it's a pretty short movie, 
but um, this particular researcher was interested in, in looking at, sorry, there's something going wrong with, odd with the movie there, um, it was interested in uh, yeast, yeast are, are very small, typically not much more than about five to seven microns in diameter, uh, and often we're interested in very small features, uh, buds uh, and scars on the, on the outside surface of yeast um, that we stained up with different probes. Um, but because yeast is so small, you obviously want to get a, a, as high a magnification and, and as high a resolution as possible. So in this instance, we actually uh, combined uh, 150 times objective on the WD uh, and actually used uncharacteristically the 25 micron pinhole, because obviously normally you'd use that with a lower mag objective, a lower NA objective. But we used the 25 micron pinhole uh, in this instance because it gives us a, a more... Um, well, yeah, it, it sort of it, it's forcing, a, if you like, a, a higher, a more confocal, a higher actual resolution uh, here. So, uh, so this combination of 150x with the 25 micron pinhole uh, was uh, was the the, the, the um, research was particularly happy with, and uh, we we didn't suffer from any detrimental bleaching either in this particular case, uh, which you might have uh, thought would have happened uh, until you did the experiment. So some technical considerations uh, here, because it, 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 I've, I've been very sort of broad in, in uh, showing you these various applications, these various sample types. So um, it, it is increasingly popular to use the SCMOS because of the large field of view for working with large samples or, or, or higher sampling um, rates. Um, and we use these also because the SCMOS has got a smaller pixel, so an SCMOS has got a 6.5 micron pixel, which is optimal for, for Nyquist sampling, so that's oversampling in Z, so that you get excellent uh, actual resolution. Um, the challenge, though, with the SCMOS is that its QE is 60% compared with the 90% of the EMCCD that had been typically used. Um, and obviously, with it being a confocal system, then you are photon limited to some extent, so, um, so a combination of this 60% uh, QE with the sort of photon limited confocal, it means that whilst we can run still fast compared with a, um, a, a point scanner, um, some of you might be using SCMOS and be aware that it can run potentially up to uh, 100 frames per second. But uh, on, a, on, a, on a spinning disk uh, confocal, because of the QE, um, you, you, will, you won't realize that top speed uh, typically. Typically our exposure with the uh, SCMOS on a, on, a, on, a, um, on the spinning disk system here is, a, is around about the 200 millisecond exposure on a, on a reasonable um, sort of medium intensity sample. Um, so, uh, but really we're using the SCMOS here because of its huge field of view uh, and its high resolution. Uh, and as I said, it's still faster than a laser scanning uh, confocal microscope. But if you want to increase sensitivity, so if you want a large field of view, um, but increase uh, sensitivity, then there is an option in uh, the form of, a, of an Ixon 888. So this is a 1,000 by 1,000 pixel camera. Uh, this will improve your sensitivity uh, back up to 90% QE, um, but you will sacrifice your Nyquist sampling for that because it has a pixel size of 13 microns. Um, but, but many, many people are, are, are quite uh, favoring the 888 uh, for the extra sensitivity uh, that it has uh, if, if they feel that the SCMOS isn't, isn't sensitive enough for them, uh, but still you would use the, the, the Ultra, the, the Ixon Ultra EMCCD, the 512 by 512 uh, sensor for maximum sensitivity. And so what we're finding is that many systems will have, because uh, we can put, up to, we can put uh, dual cameras, uh, two cameras on, onto the WD, so many systems now will have a, an Ultra on one port for when people want maximum sensitivity, and then we'll have an SCMOS, a Neo or a Xyla on the second port uh, for resolution. Other things to bear in mind, as I mentioned, would be the objective. Um, the, 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 the choice of objective here is key uh, for deep imaging. Um, it's not a surprise, uh, but you'll probably know that, that you know, a, a lot of objectives will have different properties. Some will have, high, if, you, if you have a very high NA, then typically you're sacrificing the focal depth that you can work with. Optics in recent years have improved significantly where you can now have a, a high NA objective with a good uh, focal depth uh, or working distance, I should say, not focal depth, a good working distance as well. So to get the most out of the WD, you need to really find a good objective um, because it seems that the objective, if anything, might be the limiting factor rather than the, t the, the uh, multi-point uh, WD technology. Um, so, uh, and the other thing is that the Revolution WD 
improved on the Revolution XD in many ways, um, but the XD is still going to be um, uh, a current model. It's, it's the WD will not supersede the XD completely. The XD will continue to be uh, available as an option because uh, for those people who are typically doing, let's say, single cell work or, or high mag work, and they, they want to have the very, very fastest speed, so for example, for iron imaging, for example, um, they want the fastest speeds, or they've got particularly low light fluorescence, that, you know, their stains, are, their, their, their probes are, are staining weakly or, or have, a high expression, have a low expression, then uh, for maximum sensitivity, you still may find that you need um, something like the, the XD. Uh, under those circumstances, uh, but but for for most people now the WD will be uh, the instrument of choice because it offers a br really broad research appeal from single cell to um, you know develop things uh, uh, research areas such as developmental biology, intravital imaging, neuroscience, stem cell. All of these will be looking at samples that any that start anything from single cell right through to um, you know the whole organism or, or, or large parts of the organism um, and even obviously with a larger field of view even sort of being able to screen through more samples and consequently now it is a much much uh, improved and more flexible uh, product uh, solution for core facilities uh, it's, it's not anywhere near as specialized as it was before and so a quick summary is that the revolution WD uh, this new um, improved technology it, it removes the traditional limitations of the multi-point confocal. Uh, it can now, we believe, it can now be considered as an alternative to the laser scanning confocal microscope. Why? Because you get speed, uh, you have the speed that it offers whilst maintaining a large field of view. You've got this depth of imaging that all uh, point scanners, whether they be single point or multi-point scanning uh, devices, had suffered from in the past. Um, you've got uh, this large sample size that you can work with. And also, we, ha we still have a high signal-to-noise ratio with an excellent dynamic range compared with a laser scanning confocal microscope for many, many, uh, for, for, for quite a lot of people's applications if you were to do a light-for-light -light comparison. So I would like to thank you for your time. Uh, I hope that you uh, realize now that the, the potential, uh, or the new potential that um, the multipoint scanning technology brings to the market uh, and really should open up new doors and areas of uh, an imaging potential for many of you, hopefully, that have been watching this webinar. Thank you for your time, and I will now uh, try and take some questions.